The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Todd Boyad. I think I know everyone. Hopefully, everyone's having a good day. Uh, welcome to this month's EvalFest webinar. Our topic today is evaluation from a funder's perspective. Um, this will be a panel discussion of um, program officers from four different funding agencies with histories of supporting science festivals, among many other science education in this initiatives. Um, I want to maximize our time hearing directly from them, so I will keep the housekeeping items very brief, but they are important, so we'll spend a minute or two going over those. First, we'll go with our roadmap. Um, our goal today is to learn more about evaluation from, from the perspective of our, of our funders. Um, we have joining us today representatives from a diverse array of science festival supporters. Um, these tend to be the types of funders that are most interested in robust evaluation plans. I know some of our festivals are supported by individuals. Um, they tend to not be as interested in evaluation plans as um, corporate funders and federal agencies and foundations. Um, our corporate funder representative is um, GSK. The federal funding agency is NSF. The, the, um, the private foundation is Burris Welcome Fund, and the corporate foundation is Biogen Foundation. Each of these organizations uh, have rich histories of supporting science education efforts in general and science festivals in particular. Um, I'll introduce the ind individual panelists in a minute, but first I'd like to give a couple of shout outs. The EvalFest leadership team would like to give a special shout out to our science festivals in Charleston, South Carolina and Idaho. Um, every year they serve as our guinea pigs by default. Uh, their festivals are the first on the event calendar each year, which means they're always the first in the community to try out something new. Um, for instance, this year they were the first to launch the follow-up survey and at the end of the first week, both festivals were at about a 15% response rate, which is great. Um, data collection ends this week, and we are hopeful that both will get to 20% um, by the end of this week. So well-deserved shout outs go to our colleagues in Idaho and Charleston. All right, now for our much anticipated panel discussion. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our presenters today. Each has proven themselves as uh, allies and friends of science education. Uh, they also have experienced firsthand what projects such as science festivals can do for the communities that they serve. They also see a lot of project evaluation plans in what they do, and, and we can benefit greatly, I believe, from hearing directly from them. This is also your chance to leverage their collective wisdom, so feel free to ask questions uh, of, of this group. Our first presenter is Marty Skoll Jordan. As manager of U.S. Community Partnerships for GSK, Marty is, Marty is responsible for program partnerships in Philadelphia and Research Triangle Park. Through her work, GSK supports many STEM education initiatives, including summer programs and after-school programs in North Carolina and nationally. She also has worked with GSK to provide grants supporting the Philadelphia Science Festival and the Delaware Valley Science Fair. Marty is joining us from the Research Triangle Park here in central North Carolina. Many of you know Bob Russell. He is program officer in the National Science Foundation's Directorate of Education and Human Resources, where he manages proposals concerned with informal classroom and cyber learning STEM education. NSF has supported science festival initiatives for more than a decade, and Bob currently serves as the cognizant program officer for Valfest. Bob is joining us from NSF headquarters in DC. Alfred Mays is the program officer for Burris Welcome Fund. The fund is dedicated to advancing the biomedical sciences by supporting research and educational activities. Science education projects are in Alfred's portfolio, and he works closely with us at Moorhead on several initiatives 
The Burroughs Welcome Fund has supported the North Carolina Science Festival from the very beginning and, and three years ago provided a, a $1 million gift to create an endowment for the North Carolina Science Festival. And to our knowledge, it was the first of its kind in the US. Alfred is also joining us from Research Triangle Park. Chris Barr is executive director of Biogen Foundation and head of corporate responsibility and social partnerships at Biogen. He works closely with nonprofit organizations promoting access to hands on backgrounds to pursue careers within science and technology. Biogen has been a longtime supporter of science festivals. Uh, they've been presenting, presenting sponsors of the North Carolina Science Festival for the past four years and have supported the Cambridge Science Festival from the outset. They also partnered with the Association of Science and Technology Centers on the World Biotech Tour, a three-year project that involved traveling exhibitions and science festivals throughout the world. Thanks to each of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to speak to us today. Um, I know I speak for the entire EvalFest community when I say we appreciate all you do to support science festivals and other STEM education initiatives in our communities. We could not do what we do without support from people like you. So we will begin with Marty. Uh, Marty, the floor is yours. Taylor, if you could hand off, make her presenter. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Todd. This is really exciting for us as I live, breathe, and love STEM education. And so I'm going to get started with my slideshow and just tell you a little bit about what we do here at GSK as far as um, our U.S. community partnerships. We are broken down into three different areas of giving. Um, one is nutrition and physical activity, helping children achieve or maintain a healthy weight, which really fits in with us being a healthcare pharmaceutical company. STEM, which we're all talking about today, building the STEM workforce, the employees of tomorrow, what we're looking at 5, 10, 15 years down the line, and disaster preparedness and response. Um, we have a $3 million grant out for resilient children, resilient communities. Um, if there were to be a tornado, a wildfire, an earthquake today, would you be able to get to your child? What would happen if their school or daycare would go away? Um, so we are doing a lot of research into that and how communities can better prepare themselves for children. But STEM education is at the heart of our giving um, with U.S. community partnerships. And the pictures that you see are from our Science in the Summer program that we've been doing in partnership with UNC Chapel Hill Moorhead Planetarium, for the last 10 years and 30 years in Philadelphia. Our vision for STEM education is, as a company driven by science and innovation, we want to inspire that next generation of talent. We want them to find STEM and science education as fun, engaging, evidence-based programs, and just learn to love science and become STEM literate citizens. So our local programs are broken down into Philadelphia, where we do the Delaware Valley Science Fair. We have a very big contingent of our scientists that are on the floor judging that. The PACS program, which is um, inner city kids, first generation kids going off to college um, in STEM careers. Of course, the Franklin Institute Science Festival, we were one of the founding partners that has been going on on the Parkway in Philadelphia for the last eight years. The Zoo Crew is a STEM program where kids go to the Philadelphia Zoo and learn everything from water testing to nutrition for the animals, to the engineering of the exhibits, and then the WHYY, which is Public Television Media Lab, is the science behind production. Here in North Carolina, we have a very tremendous partner with the Moorhead Planetarium. We have Science in the Summer, which is our main program. Um, science After School, which was kind of an offshoot of that program. And now, as you're seeing on that STEM van, Science on Your Street, there are two educators in it. There's curriculum with it, and it goes out to 100 counties and taking science and STEM activities into boys and girls clubs. It's just been a fabulous, fabulous um, pursuit with them. And, and Todd and I have talked about many times, I hope to have a fleet of them across the country. And then we just recently did the Empowering STEM Teacher Summit last week where we brought 110 of the top science teachers and STEM teachers in from across the state to actually teach them how to teach STEM. 
But here's our signature program, Science in the Summer. It started out 30 years ago by one of our scientists saying, my gosh, I don't see any females or minorities in this lab. So she started with one library and eight students and 270,000 students later, um, we broadened the national footprint last year. And this year we're gonna have 26 additional locations across the country, including two Native American Indian reservations, homeless shelters, our local partners are fabulous UNC Moorhead Planetarium and the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. This summer, we're doing the science of space, meteorology next summer, and the science of me in 2020. Philadelphia Science Festival, this is all done by our scientists. We fund it, but they do everything. As you see, the little kids all get lab coats and are running around the parkway. There are thousands of kids in lab coats, thanks to GSK, but it's really a fun way for kids to have that first hands-on experience with science if they don't have it. So um, what we've been working on is managing the matrix of measurement when it comes to measuring STEM programs. And we've been doing this over the last year with a logic model called True Impact. So what are we looking at? Say, for example, I'm taking one of our partners, Science in the Summer. So by delivering a one-week science curriculum with that hands-on experience to North Carolina students, we hope to inspire students' love of science and start them on their journey towards a career. So what are our success measures? What are those indicators? What is it moving forward? Well, the number of students that number one will attend, that report an increased interest in science, that take part in other their science activities, perhaps after they've done science in the summer, they will join a science club or a robotics club or take more courses and then they achieve proficiency in middle school. When these kids are in the second grade, we can't really follow them all the way until they're doing that career in science or those majors in college. So we're hopefully at the, at least the beginning levels trying to achieve that proficiency in middle school. And so once again, we're hoping to do more to inspire innovation and discovery with not only GSK, but GSK science in the summer. So thank you very much. That was my presentation. I just wanna say that um, when you're looking at managing and looking at measurement, um, you want to find indicators that will move the needle with the programs that you have. We know that kids that have been in science in the summer because it's 10 years here in North Carolina, 30 years in, in Philadelphia have gone into science careers, are scientists. We will have somebody that's doing their fellowship in neuroscience right now, five brothers in one family all going into science. And Todd can tell you the program that we have with them there's a lot of scientists that went to UNC Chapel Hill and are now scientists in the community. So it's a great program, um, but we are on the ground floor of measuring and working hand in hand with fabulous partners like UNC Moorhead. I just wanna tell you when it comes to science festivals, I will be attending one in China, leaving next week, the International Creative Science Competition, where I will not only be speaking about science in the summer to um, countries from around the world, but I'm also a judge as part of a delegation. And um, our GSK Foundation has been a longtime sponsor of the North Carolina Science Festival. So thank you. Great, um, Marty. Um, does, let's see, does anybody have any questions at this point? We'll also have questions at the end for the entire panel. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Perfect. Marty. I will go ahead and change things over to Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, and do I need to do anything to, or? There you go, it should be. Show my screen. Yes. Okay, now you can see my, oh, I don't wanna show you my screen because I've got a million things on it. You'll see how disorganized I am. Uh, okay, one second to get a, get the view that I want. There we go. Okay. Well, the National Science Foundation, as you probably know, is an independent federal agency that receives a, between eight and nine billion dollars a year to fund scientific research and STEM education focused projects. So NSF funds like soup to nuts and research, uh, pretty much all the basic research that you 
that you see is, uh, with the exception of health research focused on human health and health treatments by NIH, um, NSF funds pretty much everything else. It's, you know, astronomy, physics, biology, uh, computer science, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see on the first slide here, NSF's core values, of course, scientific excellence, learning, inclusiveness, and then accountability. And the last one, obviously, uh, is directly relevant for evaluation. Um, so here are the key themes with respect to NSF's research and investment in uh, education. NSF funds research on STEM learning and learning environments. And that, and that includes both, you know, what you might say cognitive and non-cognitive foundations of STEM. So not only are kids learning specific concepts, but uh, some of the there are some underlying qualities, you know, motivation, interest, persistence, grit, et cetera. Those kinds of things can support uh, students to persist in learning about STEM. Uh, and uh, NSF also supports the research and development of innovative tools and approaches to creating uh, more effective learning environments, as well as uh, in the case of Valfest, uh, assessment tools, which help science festivals improve their um, the nature of the activities that you support and provide you with some tools to measure the impact. So here's just uh, three examples of projects funded by the Advancing Informal STEM Learning Program. And I also like to point out that um, NSF funds you know, projects in classrooms, outside the classroom, which is everything from cyber learning to museum exhibits to media to after school to citizen science, maker, you know, just it goes on and on. So there are, you know, and then in addition, NSF supports undergraduate and graduate level projects on, on science. So pretty much NSF funds research and development on STEM education from when you're born to when you're no longer on the earth. Um, Here's one example, youth radio, and just in a nutshell, you, I know you can't read the print there, but uh, there's some photos of people, of the participants doing stuff, and basically they, they, learn, they learn STEM content, they learn about the process of science, and then they act as jur journalists, and they work to produce uh, radio segments that are broadcast on local or national, national public radio programs. So this program is, at this point, they've received several grants from NSF, and it's, it's engaged uh, several thousand youth. And uh, it's been a very effective way to get these, these youth, most of whom are from low income and or minority backgrounds. So there's one example. And an important part of their project is evaluation to fine tune the project as uh, their new program elements are under development, and then to assess the impact of the program. Another example, CHISPA. This is an after-school program. The Frost Science Center in Miami had developed an after-school science curriculum in English, and that had proven to be effective through evaluation. So they applied for a, to a, for a grant to NSF to adapt the program, both uh, content-wise and culturally, so that it would be effective for Latino students and families. And they have developed partnerships uh, with 10 science museums in collaboration with 10 community organizations uh, to implement the program. Uh, in those contexts. And so there again, the program has, has gone through a full process of evaluation to make sure that the adaptation of the program is effective with Latino students and families, and also to look at the partnership aspect of the program. Uh, one more example, STEM guides, and this is to uh, develop youth in rural Maine to be STEM facilitators uh, and to engage communities there uh, to engage communities there in science through a, a range of events such as teen science cafes, uh, garden programs, and etc. So just to, that that just doesn't you know just represents the variety of programs. And if you go if you look at uh, the informalscience.org website, which has a repository of all of the projects that have been funded by the informal science program, you'll find you know just the rich variety. So where does, where does evaluation fit in? Well, NSF, oh, somebody did this slide fancy so it doesn't pop up all at once. At any rate, uh, NSF has two merit review criteria for evaluating proposals that are submitted. And an important part of uh, one of those is uh, intellectual merit. You know, does the project add new knowledge about how we engage students in STEM? And then the second is broader impacts. 
does the project have practical impacts that are of value to the field of informal STEM learning? And so, uh, so all proposals are required to address those two broad review criteria. Anyway, you know, in a nutshell, and I'm sure you're all over this, uh, the, the two broad purposes of evaluation from NSS perspective is first uh, to improve the project as it's, as it's undergoing development and implementation. You know, any project can, any project can benefit, you know, by constantly looking at how it's doing and if the, if the way that the project is designed is effective. And then the other angle, of course, is to look at did the project achieve what it was supposed to achieve based on the proposal and um, and what kinds of impacts did the program have? And of course, this is all very important to NSF because we're spending your money and so we're accountable to make sure that your investment, you know, that money has been well spent. So that's really at the bottom line of why NSF has a strong interest in evaluation because we need to assure taxpayers and Congress and so forth that the, the dollars are being wisely spent and are having the kind of impact that, that uh, they're designed to have. So NSF has two different ways of looking at evaluation and it really, there's no formula that NSF uses for, you know, there's no, you know, one process for evaluation. You know, each evaluation is, is somewhat unique Obviously, there are a lot of resources you can draw upon to put together an evaluation, but uh, evaluation should should provide you know the evaluation, as I said, of the process in in uh, progress as well as the impact. And so, uh, an evaluation it depends on the nature of the project. In some cases, an external review carried out by an advisory panel may serve as the evaluation of a project. In other cases, for example, when an entirely new approach to STEM learning, such as let's say a, a new after-school curriculum is being, being developed, then that would probably require an external evaluator to be hired, you know, and to design an evaluation process to do, you know, observations, surveys, other measurements, whatever is appropriate for the nature of the project, as well as to conduct, you know, the impact evaluation once the program has been developed and, and you know, the intent is to develop is to assess the overall impact of the project so this is just sort of a rundown probably of some of the points I've already made you know the purpose evaluation well is the project moving along is it making satisfactory progress towards its goals uh, is it making some evidence-based adjustments to project plans you know in other words giving the project feedback to help improve how it's doing uh, is the project is the evaluation determining the effectiveness and the impact of the, of the intervention. And, also, and finally, making sure that the project is delivering what it said it would deliver. Um, and so all projects at NSF have to have an external evaluation. And again, it's, a, it's just a, the external evaluation for NSF has a solution you know, or, or a, a template you follow. And, uh, and these are the typical design elements of the evaluation for NSF. You know, questions, what is the data to be gathered? How is that data uh, going to be analyzed? And, uh, and then in a proposal, typically people describe the expertise and experience of the evaluator. You're supposed to carry out that work. Uh, here's some websites with uh, just, I mean, there's a ton of, there's a ton of resources on evaluation. You, you know, it's kind of a black hole. You could you could spend you know the next couple of years reading all the research and practical information about evaluation. In any event, uh, the informalscience.org is a resource website funded by NSF, and this link here. If you go to informalscience.org, you'll find a whole wealth of resources of, of all varieties on STEM education outside the classroom. And this particular link will lead you to some resources on evaluation. Um, the next the next link. This is another resource website supported by NSF for the ITES program, which focuses on youth and, and STEM careers. And there again, there are a number of resources on evaluation. And the third is um, the, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has developed a lot of resources on evaluation for citizen science projects. And I believe that some of the, some of the resources that are being developed for EvalFest are adaptations of some of those resources. In any event, there's some great evaluation resources there. That link will take you to their toolkit and 
probably some of the general guidelines that they provide in there will, will give you some good guidance. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, science festivals before science festivals were common. I was director of a project called Celebra La Ciencia, and I'll touch a little bit on evaluation. We organized coalitions in five cities across the United States, you know, to universities, museums, research organizations, community organizations, and uh, we would piggyback on existing Latino festivals. The purpose of the project was to engage Latino students and families in STEM and connect them with local science resources. So these are just some photos of some of scenes from some of the festivals. Uh, the, the project operated from 2001 until 2009, and we also used media to promote the festivals, and we had a toll-free helpline so that if a family wanted to find out where the festival was or wanted to find local science resources, we could refer them to the local science resources. So the idea was to engage families through media, uh, provide a method for to link them with local science resources, and then to have the event so that the families could come and see the resources directly for themselves if a museum was presenting some hands-on tabletop exhibits or demonstrations or the university was presenting. to, so to speak, change the face of STEM by showing Latino families that Latinos do science and they're excited about science. So we did, uh, we did various kinds of evaluation with the festivals. We found that um, about everybody said they learned something new. Uh, Hands-on activities were, were very popular and the interesting thing was uh, the activities that we had were typical hands-on interactives that you might find in a science museum. So the, you know, the challenge was then, you know, the, the challenge didn't lie in the activities um, or, or getting, I mean, to the, the challenge for science museums is often getting people to come into the building once you're in there. And then if the activities are presented, you know, in a bilingual format or with, with bilingual explainers, well then usually they work very well. Um, so just a couple of more scenes and, you know, people had a, had a fantastic time, just a couple of quotes there. And just more colorful photos of people enjoying science. So science festivals have, you know, science festivals like every other great idea have existed for decades. And uh, so uh, you're all doing good work. Um, so I would encourage you to look at the informalscience.org website and the other resource websites that NSF has. There's my email. And I'll send Todd these slides so that you can find me if you want to contact me further for, I'm happy. I love talking to people on the phone about science festivals and other projects. So um, please feel free to contact me and uh, thank you for the opportunity to make a presentation. Thanks, Bob. I think we'll hold our questions to the end. We'll go ahead and move to Alfred next. Perfect, I'll cue that up. All right. Okay. Uh, looks like I'm visible, correct? My screen is up. Yes. yes. Okay, great. So I'll try not to be too redundant um, in, in many of the elements of evaluation, um, but would start out by giving a little background on the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Um, as Todd mentioned in the introduction, um, I've worked uh, with Burroughs Welcome for the past three years and have been primarily responsible for science education and diversity in science, of which most of my work uh, is based here in North Carolina and working with K-12 community colleges and the university system. Uh, but the primary mission for Burroughs Welcome Fund is really to advance the medical sciences by supporting research and other scientific and educational activities, uh, primarily in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, and we do some partnerships with other organizations that might have more of a global focus. Uh, of course, we've worked closely with the Welcome Trust, um, but for the most part, we concentrate strictly on the U.S. and Canada. So here in North Carolina, um, this is dated a little bit, but you can see that we are uh, one of the significant uh, funders um, in North Carolina. And you can see there that behind Duke Endowment, uh, we've made some, some fairly large contributions and investments uh, 
uh, in the state along with several other funders. And we have um, grant making strategies that basically consist of um, ad hoc, uh, there's milestone and legacy uh, type of activities that we, we provide or opportunities that we provide and also the competitive process. And within my specific area, STEM education um, is the primary um, element of grant giving tied primarily to education here in, in North Carolina. Uh, but the other role with um, our strategy is development of investigators in targeted areas of science that are undervalued and underfunded. And in some instances, that is very direct. And in other instances, it's a little bit more subtle and integrated into uh, specific strategies that we implement with various organizations. So across the Burroughs Welcome Fund, there are four uh, program officers, and you can see the list there of the different areas um, that we divide our responsibilities into. Um, my primary responsibility, again, science education and diversity in science. Diversity in science stands alone um, for us right now in that we have a very direct effort with our postdoc uh, career progression with underrepresented minorities. Um, but we do have diversity as um, a strategy within science education across STEM programming. And if you reflect back on, on where we were in terms of giving across North Carolina and being a major funder uh, in the state, uh, here's a, uh, a good capture of how that giving is divided across our, our different program areas. And you can see there that science education, uh, at least in 2016, was 13.1% of our total giving. And we normally give about 32 million uh, a year. And um, you can do the math there and, and understand that a significant portion of that um, is tied directly to science education. And then just a little bit more detail on, the, on those program areas. Um, informal education is a big part of it. Our largest competitive grant um, is a student science enrichment program. And that's primarily informal science. And we've actually changed the name this year to student STEM enrichment. Uh, back in 1996, when we actually stood up that activity, uh, STEM was not the common reference. And we've modified our RFP and all of our narrative to reflect more of a STEM uh, global approach to science previous references and um, of course math and technology and engineering being a part of that. Uh, we do support formal education as well and I kind of categorize that as a formal school day. Um, we give career awards for math and science teachers um, which is $175,000 over a five-year period and I'll cover some details on that in just a minute. Uh, we also provide support for teachers with equipment and supplies and professional development to support uh, their use uh, of the equipment and supplies that's purchased. And then we have um, what I refer to as our, our legacy awards and ad hoc, which is our Singapore math pilot um, that we've introduced into low wealth uh, school districts in North Carolina um, to address um, not only student growth in, in math, but also piloting uh, the various strategies within Singapore math to see if it might be an investment that the state might want to uh, take on with, with other low performing schools. And our UNC Fast Track Scholarships is a partnership with the UNC system. Um, some of you may be familiar with the UTeach model in that uh, undergraduate STEM majors seek licensure to teach uh, in parallel with their, their uh, degree and are obligated to scholarships to actually uh, go into the classroom shortly after uh, graduation. And we've had some success there. We also dibble and dabble in public policy and research. Uh, we have several organizations that we partner with across the state. And we seek to build capacity uh, by partnerships uh, with various organizations, including Moorhead. Um, one of the initiatives tied to the Science Festival uh, would be our NC STEM portal. And that partnership consists of our collaboration with the uh, connectory at the national level. Um, we have an aggregator here in North Carolina called the North Carolina Science Mathematics 
Technology Education Center, SMT for short, that does a wonderful job of uh, serving as the point and central resource for STEM here in North Carolina through an articulation agreement with K-12 Community College and University System. So we've actually worked closely with them to develop a portal that's a one-stop shop. And we partnered with the Science Festival to actually administer the back end of that system and incorporate their common calendaring into uh, an existing calendar. So we truly have built uh, a one-stop shop and we're, we're delighted that um, more than 600 events are actually in our database currently. And, and many of them are Science Festival events as a result of this partnership. And we're also a major member of the STEM Funders Network at the national level, uh, STEM Ecosystems. Uh, have been evolving over the past few years. Um, we've actually established two ecosystems here in North Carolina, um, STEM in the eastern part of the state and STEM in the western part of the state. And we actually leverage um, the opportunities and, and activities within each region uh, with the Science Festival also. And again, we're, we're delighted that we're able to partner uh, with Moorhead on that effort. And then the North Carolina Center for After School Programs, um, they are our aggregator for all after school providers. They're an advocate and a champion for after school programming. And one element of that would be STEM. And we seek to support their work and to raise awareness uh, with after school providers and help them bring about high quality STEM programming within their after school programs. So I mentioned SSEP. I won't cover um, too much detail here, but we have invested over a period of time uh, I think we're up to about 33 million. Uh, that RFP is actually posted currently, and we have a uh, deadline of April uh, 2018. And the awards consist of $180,000 over three years, renewable in some instances. Uh, we do ask for a sustainability plan as a part of that, so evaluation is key when programs come back to us uh, to show success and impact, and we start to evaluate and determine whether or not um, it can be sustained through a renewal cycle or um, they have the capacity to actually continue on, hopefully with, uh, with other resources available to them. And back to the um, equipment and supplies that we provide to teachers. Um, we make about 60 to 70 awards, um, up to $4,500, of course, split by the uh, equipment purchase and the PD to support uh, the grant as a whole. And that's actually alternating years between our CASMAT award. Not a lot of evaluation here. We hope to introduce uh, some element of surveying in the future. Uh, but right now, we uh, are excited about the fact that we get to actually help teachers uh, get equipment into their classrooms, integrate it into their, their curriculum, and uh, provide professional development support to them. And across our programs, um, we have key goals. Um, the three goals here primarily apply to our student STEM enrichment program, uh, but we're constantly looking for uh, the impact and whether or not there's uh, growth and development and, and greater student outcomes and competence uh, is increasing. Um, as the other two presenters mentioned, the enthusiasm and excitement uh, is a part of that enrichment, and we do uh, survey uh, standard in, in a way, but also we look for programs receiving awards through the Burroughs Welcome Fund to build evaluation uh, design into their specific project because we do advocate for creativity and innovation. So of all the programs across the state that we support, they're all different. Uh, not many are alike. So it's hard to actually evaluate in a standard format, but there are elements based on the goals that we do have consistency in terms of pre and post surveys and some tracking. And then an interesting um, students in pursuing careers in research or other science related areas. Um, I think it was Marty that said you can only track students so far, uh, but we do track them to the extent that we know they're engaged in subsequent programs and we fund programs in those subsequent stages. So to see their attendance and participation and engagement uh, pop up in a, a different program or a different award or funded activity uh, does give us an indication that there's some progression occurring uh, based on their enrichment experiences. And then a little bit on our position on evaluation. We truly consider our investments um, to be just that. And we consider our returns to really be that we now look at our awardees as ha 
having assets. And we truly enforce uh, reporting so that we can map where those assets are and promote uh, networking and resource sharing and leveraging uh, when it makes sense. And many of our awardees actually uh, uh, do that on their own. And then when they learn of another program that they could actually uh, build off of, um, it, it just makes for a solid design. So we, that's really the position that we take with, uh, with our awards. The reporting requirements are, are pretty standard. Uh, we ask for annual progress reports. And within the progress reports, there's some data capture um, and tracking and reporting that, that uh, programs already have as a part of their, their tracking. So it's really just a pushed upward so we could have it in a more central database. Uh, determination of impact, of course, is, is based on the uh, evaluation design. Um, many of them seek technical assistance, and many of them have internal resources or in-house resources that they rely on. Um, but we always ask, you know, and what measures are you putting in place to actually determine impact? Um, piloting and scale. We love to support pilots. Um, we partner with the state in some instances where we're able to, as a private foundation, make investments in various pilots and not put tax dollars at risk. And then hopefully when it enters into a um, implementation phase or a production phase, we're able to advocate for scale and have state dollars perhaps introduced at that point where we know we've had success. And evaluation certainly is a, is a part of that. And there's the two forms of R&D. Um, we support research and development, but we also support rip off and duplicate. So you have early adopters and you have those who are um, in a position and have the readiness level to actually uh, pilot programs. And then you have others with less resources, less capacity, and they're not at a readiness level to actually um, design a program, but they are ready to implement, especially if they know that there were um, successes and, and lessons learned, and it's something that they can actually adopt uh, versus spending uh, a lot of early uh, time into uh, the research and development aspects. And again, our, our expectations uh, with design, you know, I've talked with a number of programs, uh, especially our smaller organizations and nonprofits that simply do not have um, the technical staff um, to put in place a formal evaluation design. And when they do get technical assistance or they do ask about the evaluation element uh, being a part of their proposal, we oftentimes tell them to first relax that, you know, we're going to get through it together. And then second, we, we basically say, begin with the end in mind. What would be your keynote address or your presentation three years, five years, ten years down the road? And be able to write the narrative and tell the story, but be comfortable with leaving blanks. And hopefully at the point you're determining your evaluation design, you should be able to start to fill in those blanks of that narrative. We also tell them, if you were to produce a news article about your program or your, your project a few years down the road, what headline, what highlights would you include in that article? So once they get the big picture and know kind of where to start and how to tell that story, they can work backwards from that point and use technical assistance that we provide to start to build in uh, the actual elements of their, their, their design. Um, we also promote having an evaluator at the very beginning of that discussion, even in the grant writing process. An evaluator oftentimes come in in the middle or toward the end, depending on if it's a formative or a summative evaluation. And many of them wish they were at the table during the design phase so that they could help actually um, identify what type of data can be collected, what kind of practices can be put in place to help inform um, what kind of surveys would be ideal given that design, instead of coming in later and having to kind of retrofit and, and build a design based on some decisions that were made early on. And we, we always preach, catch, capture as much data as you possibly can. Uh, in some instances, you're not sure if that data will be valuable or, or of use, but if this activity that's occurring, try to capture as much of it as possible and allow the evaluation team uh, to start to make sense of the data. Uh, and then formative and summative, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I love this 
particular slide that our, our technical uh, lead shares during orientation for many of our awardees. Um, and that's getting a clear understanding of at what point are you thinking formative and at what point are you thinking summative. And I oftentimes describe it as steering the ship. Uh, at what point do you want to change course when you're uh, looking at certain indicators? Uh, in many instances, you don't want to wait to the very end of your project to make those changes uh, based on what you're seeing or what you're tracking. And then oftentimes a simple form of uh, explaining that is when the cook tastes the soup, that's formative, and when the guest tastes the soup, that's summative. And the logic model was, was mentioned in, in Marty's presentation. Uh, we've learned through feedback from the awardees that the logic model is so helpful, the strategy is so helpful. Even if it's not a formal model, just having the ability to map out and tie your activities to your goals, to have a visual and a flow chart that shows how your resources are actually in place um, to support those activities. And there are several models uh, that can be used. Here's one example uh, of an uneasy visual that many of our teachers have actually adopted and, and have stated that it's very helpful for them. And the major categories there you can see with the problem statement all the way through uh, determining some of the external factors. And in summary, uh, again, our position is we hope that our worries are, are simply working diligently to be good stewards. Um, evaluation certainly is an accountability uh, piece to that. And we know that tracking, updating, and communicating uh, is key through the progress reports. Um, we think that sharing your findings, the tried and true, the lessons learned, and the recommendations uh, that might come out of your evaluation are key. Going back to the research and development or the rip off and duplicate, both are R&D. And there are organizations waiting to, uh, to be able to buy in to a particular design that was successful. Uh, so we'd love to have the recommendations that comes out of uh, the findings. And then those unintended outcomes, good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, sometimes our evaluations are uh, the report for determining uh, whether there were unintended outcomes and how do we actually build on uh, those positives. And then building capacity through collaboration and networking. Uh, we oftentimes talk about the proficiencies that you need throughout uh, the team effort. And networking and resource sharing is certainly a part of that. And we seek to build capacity. And evaluation gives us enough information that we can actually do that in many cases across our different awards. So I'll stop there. Thank you for the time, uh, Todd. And do you want to? allow questions now or we'll continue to wait until the end yeah we'll go to chris and then we'll have a, a few minutes at the end to um ask questions and i have one question i want to ask each of you but we'll hold that to the very end also move on to chris perfect I'll thank, go you. thank you thank you make chris the presenter Sorry, I was on mute. Can everyone see that? <laughs> Hello? Yep. We can see it. All right. All right. That's all I needed. Okay, cool. Um, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think you're going to hear a lot of the same sentiments when uh, I go through uh, my presentation as well. Again, uh, I'm head of uh, corporate responsibility and social, in, uh, social, sorry, social investments here at um, Biogen. I also head up the Biogen Foundation. I'm the executive director uh, for the past couple of years. So our mantra here is caring deeply, changing lives. That's what the company stands for, and everything else that we uh, we do, uh, we also stand for. Uh, how do we make an impact in the community? The foundation was founded uh, 15, a little over 15 years ago in 2002, and we have seen uh, the our impact actually go up dramatically over the last few years. We have a number of programs that we focus on. I'll get into those um, as we go to the next slide, which is not changing. For some reason, it's a high the control panel. Let's see if this works now. 
Okay, so the vision of the foundation is to provide underserved students the same opportunities uh, to pursue careers in science and biotechnology to bolster uh, the much needed pipeline of the future resources. So we all know STEM is a growing field. In fact, what, we, what we're what we seeing here, not only in Cambridge, but North Carolina, is that this is where a majority of the future jobs are going to be is in this industry, whether it's biotechnology, whether it's uh, coding, high tech, uh, this is the area where it's going to be. But we're seeing a lot of students aren't going to this direction. So we wanted to make sure that we had a focus on that piece. When we looked at our mission, the whole piece is to provide access to science education. We also focus on essential human services to children. Uh, and the reason we do this is we believe that if a student doesn't have a uh, doesn't know where their next meal is coming from, where they live, they're not going to be focused students on the STEM side. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we sort of have the holistic view of the students and, and what they are going through in their lives. The major thing is we're, we're committed to par uh, sparking a passion for science. We want to make sure that we're supporting effective initiatives. We're looking to make science education accessible to diverse populations. But more importantly, we want to make it fun. We want to, we want to inspire these next generation of uh, leaders in science who you know, are most likely going to be taking on the challenges that face our society in the future, but more importantly, uh, probably probably my future bosses as well. So I, I figure we got to we got to make got to make nice with them now. Um, but we look for programming that does that and really inspire them to to continue on a pathway of science. So we have a number of different programs that we focus on with the foundation. Um, the first one we focus on is our. Uh, and I'll kind of do this a little bit backwards, but you know, on our employee side, we have our employee matching gift program. Our employee matching gift program last year, we we did about 1.66 million dollars in in matches uh, to uh, to various organizations that our employees gave. If an employee gives fifty dollars or more of a donation, we will match it dollar for dollar up to twenty five thousand dollars in a given in a, in a calendar year. Uh, we had probably about 2,700 employees out of 4,500 eligible employees participate in this program. So this is obviously one of our most popular employee engagement programs. The other program we have is called Community Currency. We have a number of employees that like to engage in the community, and I'll talk a little bit about how we align that with our overall, with our grants program. The employees want to give their time. It's it's sort of like a dollars for doers type program. If, a, if an employee gives a hour of their time, the foundation will put $10 into their giving account that they can then donate to an organization of their choosing. So they could either give it to the organization that they're working with or they could give it to a different organization uh, they feel passionate about. The reason we did it that way is uh, I'll talk about our signature STEM program, which is our community lab program. We actually have hands-on uh, science labs dedicated to students coming in free of charge. Teachers bring their students in. They'll do hands-on experiments uh, in a real working lab. And the idea is uh, employees come in, they help mentor, they also help engage with the students. And because it's a corporate initiative, they are volunteering their time. We wanted to give a mechanism where we were encouraging people to go and do this, but at the same time, um, they could still earn money to give to organizations that they're choosing. So that's why we give a little flexibility in the community currency program. And then we have our disaster relief uh, response. So when, uh, you know, a disaster strikes, um, we kind of focus on extraordinary events. So the flooding from Hurricane Matthew down in North Carolina a couple of years back, uh, this was obviously an extraordinary event impacting where a lot of our employees lived and work. We would do an enhanced match. So we use the employee matching gift program as a starting point. But what we do is we do a three for one match um, for every dollar that employees put in, again, $50 or more, we'll match a three for one. So employee puts in $50, we'll put in $150. Uh, recently with the hurricanes in uh, Texas, the Caribbean, and then Puerto Rico, uh, coming run, one right after another, we were able to raise over $450,000 in a six-week period uh, to help those in need. So our employees are definitely committed to back and making an impact in the communities and we didn't have any facilities in any of those areas so they were really um, responded amazingly uh, in, in each situation. The other pieces that we focus on are really the grants program. So we have a U.S. and international grants programs. Again, 
focusing on those two areas of science education and strong communities. Those are sort of the two areas that we, we look at. We mainly focus our U.S. and international grants in areas that we have facilities. So we've, we've really made a conscious effort to say, look, we're going to be focusing on uh, Massachusetts and North Carolina. We've sort of, uh, I don't want to say narrowed it down, but we've really uh, aligned it where our facilities are. So Wake and Durham counties and up here, uh, Cambridge, Somerville, and Boston are where we uh, really focus our attention on. International, we've mainly just focused on Switzerland at this point. That's where our international headquarters are, but we are looking at a couple initiatives and programs that would actually touch on all our affiliates uh, across the globe, which are about 26. So we're, we're really excited about that potential program uh, that we hope to launch later this year. Um, and then our last piece is our um, you know, our signature STEM program, which is our community lab program. Again, we've been doing this program. Uh, this was actually founded also in 2002. And we've really aligned it with our giving strategy as we work with nonprofits in the area. And then, you know, again, focusing on our strategy, we really wanted to focus our external strategy in one word, and that was access. So under science education, uh, we're really looking at access to hands-on science education, access to teacher development opportunities in science because we're finding a lot of middle school and some high school teachers don't have that science background. And then last but definitely not least, access to college readiness and support. This is less about taking the SATs. This is more about having an infrastructure when a student wants to go to college, um, making sure they have the access and tools to uh, in, you know, understand how to fill out the financial aid forms, you know, building that mentorship and that alignment around these students so they can be successful and have the same opportunity as a student that has that infrastructure uh, would have. So, you know, if a parent, if a student has two parents that went to college, you know, we're, versus a student that has nobody that went to college in their families, or it might be a single parent or English as a second language, we want to make sure they have the same uh, infrastructure necessary to be successful. And then on the strong community side, this is the access to basic social needs, the child hunger, child homelessness, social mobility opportunities that we talked about. And then on the employee engagement, that's where we have our community labs program, our community currency program. And we also have our Care Deeply Day, which is our volunteer uh, day program, uh, where um, one day a year, the whole company uh, has the opportunity to participate in a global day of service. Uh, last year, about 2,600 employees across the globe participated in uh, over 50 projects in 26 countries um, uh, as part of that day. So we've really been uh, uh, making an impact on that day. And this kind of spurs people wanting to give their time going forward in, in other capacities. So one of the things that we are looking at and we're, we've actually announced up here, is our STAR program. So we've done it here in Cambridge as a pilot. We want to see how it is. But what we're doing is we've, been, we've made a commitment to invest $10 million over the next four years to work with between four to six partners. Um, and the idea is they would work together to support students in science. So they would have to fall into those three parameters of access to science education, access to teacher development opportunities, or access to college training and support. The idea is we make them work as a unit. Um, so we'd hold in different measurements in the communities of Somerville and Cambridge, but we want to see and test this out and see how the strategy goes. The idea is instead of um, sprinkling a lot of money across the state in those areas and those regions, we really want to make them commit and partner them together and have them aligned with our annual partners as well. And what our thought process is, we would do this election every four years. It's a very rigorous process. We'd expect them to participate in quarterly meetings. We would want board positions. But on the other end, we'd be giving them possibly two for one employee matching gifts, possibly two times for community currency of any of our employees that participate, volunteer, and first dibs on volunteer and sponsorship opportunities as well. So the idea is really partnering with a, a, a core set of organizations uh, to really make an impact in the community. And then our community lab program. So we've um, obviously have been committed to science education for a number of years. We, we see this as uh, an opportunity. Our, our CEO 15 years ago uh, saw this as an opportunity where he was seeing a number of students not really engaging in science education. So wanted to say, hey, look, let's bring these students right into a working lab and have them work hands on. We've had the lab up here for 15 years in North, Car uh, North Carolina. We've had that uh, lab for probably three 
uh, actually, sorry, four years now. And uh, combined, we've had over 44,000 students come through those lab, those lab spaces to participate on free hands-on learning. Uh, we have strong partnerships at Wake and Durham counties. We have very strong partnerships here in Cambridge and Somerville. But we've also expanded outside those areas. Uh, a lot of our nonprofit partners have participated in programming. A lot of other schools um, have reached out to see if they could take their classes here. And to be honest with you, we have had a waiting list on both of those in just a short amount of time. Um, but the, the, the great part is we also do summer programming. We try to diversify the classrooms as much as we possibly can. We can accommodate 32 students at a time. Uh, and some days we actually have more than one class in there at a time, so or in during the day. Uh, so it's, it's really amazing to see the work that they do. And it's sort of been a catalyst uh, up here where two other companies have followed our lead and recently opened up their own learning labs. Um, so I think that's all the slides I have, um, but I'm willing to answer any questions, and I know we're getting close to time as well. So I will, I will turn it back over to you, uh, Jonathan. Hey, thanks, Chris. Um, let's see, Taylor. If do you do we have any questions? I have. I just have a comment from Larry Cernick, and he just said, "Very informative webinar. Thank you." Okay. Um, well, if anybody wants to ask a question, you go ahead and type it in. I have one question I'd um, ask the whole panel, so if all of you can un unmute your um, microphones. Um, what do you wish um, everyone knew about evaluation? Um, maybe it's it's not what's it, what you'd like to see in evaluation plans that you're not seeing, or maybe there's a skill that we just don't have as an evaluation community. But uh, I'd love to hear from each of you if you have an opinion on that. Hi, Bob here. If you, can, if you don't have a you know, significant grant funding your program, evaluation is still good. And it, you don't need to spend a lot of money to get some basic information. It's pretty much like a business that's customer service, and you want to find out from the perspective of the of the students, the users, how is it going? And so you can often gather some really good information without uh, needing to hire an external evaluator and you know spending huge amounts of money. That that kind of evaluation is very important and if you're especially if you're doing a major new program well it's probably critical that you do that but I would emphasize that do you know ongoing evaluation is a great thing and if you can get constant feedback on your program both how the participants are perceiving it and their perspectives on it and then if there are some indicators of impact that you can gather along the way that can that can really help you fine-tune your program and make sure you're still doing good work yeah, I'll, this is Chris, uh, Chris Barr. I'll, I'll echo those sentiments. I mean, evaluation is always key. I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's, there's nothing I've been missing in, my, in the grant proposals that I have. We have um, a number of the, the way we do the evaluations when we work with a partner is we have a set number of questions that we're looking for. And, you know, Marty talked about this a little earlier. We're looking for impact. Uh, how many students is it impacting? What kind of impact? How are you measuring impact? Um, but there's, you know, also, you know, from a foundation standpoint, we're always trying to educate our employees what we do and why we give this money out. I think when people see a foundation, particularly a corporate foundation, they think it's more just, oh, you know, I get this all the time. Oh, you get to give out money. That sounds like fun. Well, there's a number of programs that we're saying no to because we just don't feel uh, they're going to make the impact or align uh, versus some other programs. So we're always looking for those opportunities where we can showcase the students in the programs, the activities that are going on, because it's not even just the impact that the organization is making, but it's the impact that we can get back uh, to our employees, to our leadership, that they can see what we're doing. You know, this is one of the reasons why we partner with the North Carolina Science Festival and also the Cambridge Science Festival up here in Massachusetts. It's because you know, uh, it's there's so many hands-on activities for all different ages and so in a, in a variety of different places, and it has such a, an overarching reach. Our employees are always going to see that, so when they they expect to see our name there because of what we stand for, and then when they see us, they're doing different things, uh, different activities, hands-on experiments. There's a sense of pride, and they want to bring their students to, uh, they want to bring their own kids to it because you know their children want to know what mom and dad do for a living, and here they get to see it, they get to explore it, and they get to participate in it. So that's why the partnership's been really good for for 
uh, for Biogen anyway. Thanks, Chris. This is Marty. I was just going to say, as funders, it's important for us to know that our dollars are doing what they should be doing. Um, as grantees, don't think it's hard. Don't think it's complicated. We're here to help you. We have folks that we work with with True Impact, with the Logic Model, that are, are willing to help you as well. We just want it to be a smooth process and know that as many kids as possible are getting impacted. Um, and that the program is making sense moving forward. So it shouldn't be anything that anybody is afraid of as we're here to help you. And we originally gave you the money because we believe in you and we want to grow our programs. Mm -hmm. And Todd, I'll just quickly add, I know we're, we're over time, that um, I love to see the cross-sector collaboration, even with evaluators. Um, we oftentimes collaborate among funders and we ask programs uh, and providers to collaborate amongst themselves. Um, but I have several external evaluators working with several different programs, and the excitement and enthusiasm they bring about being able to share data and share strategies and design um, is just unbelievable. So they, they too, are a part of uh, making connections and um, not just being a sole source in, in various situations, but balancing their strengths and weaknesses based on their, their ability to uh, evaluate across programs. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, everybody. I think that'll be it in terms of time. Um, thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Bob, Chris, Marty. Thank you for your time um, and your insights. If anybody has any follow-up questions, just email me, and I'll I'll make sure the the panel hears those, and on, on, I'll email everybody those those answers. Um, uh, Taylor, if you'll Give it back to me. Um, I'll finish up. All right. So um, just to, to move ahead here, and we'll finish up in just two seconds. Um, the next upcoming uh, ValFest webinar is on April 19th. We have a video analysis with Catherine and Michelle Phillips, Catherine Nielsen, Michelle Phillips. May 17th is the May webinar, Creating One-Page Reports, A Strategy for Engaging Busy Readers. Um, Emma Perk and Lisa Wilson-Beck from Western Michigan University will provide um, insights about that. And that's all we have for today. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks again to the presenters, panelists. I appreciate um, everyone sharing their insights. Um, and uh, you guys have a good day. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.